This video clip uses palpation of the pronator teres to illustrate many of the palpation guidelines that are discussed in Chapter 2, The Art and Science of Muscle Palpation, of the textbook. The pronator teres attaches proximally to the medial epicondyle of the humerus here, the medial supracondylar ridge of the humerus, and the coronoid process of the ulna. From here it runs down distally to attach to the lateral radius approximately one-third of the way down the shaft. It is important to know the attachments of the muscle so we know where to place our fingers. In this case, I know the muscles located about here. And because the pronator teres is superficial, I know that the force of my pressure can be light to medium. But can I be sure that I'm on it? For this, I need to know its actions. The pronator teres flexes the forearm at the elbow joint, but a better action might be that it pronates the forearm at the radio-ulnar joints. So I will place his forearm here and I will ask him to pronate and that engages the muscle and makes it palpably harder. If that engagement is not enough, I could add resistance to his contraction, which will make the pronator teres even harder and stand out more. Generally, it is best to find the target muscle in the easiest place possible first. For the pronator teres, it is here, mid-belly. I then ask him to contract against my resistance and I strum across the muscle as we see here. I then ask the client to relax and I move a baby step along the line of the muscle. He contracts and I strum perpendicularly across it again. He relaxes, I move another baby step and I strum perpendicularly against it again as he contracts and another baby step along the line of the muscle here. Notice that when I'm strumming the muscle, I am strumming perpendicular to it. It is not a small little vibration. It is actually a large excursion strum from one side of the muscle to the top of it to the other side of the muscle. Another thing to notice is that if I held his hand here to resist the pronation, that would make other muscles that cross the wrist joint contract and that would make it hard to discern the pronator teres from the flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus, and the flexor carpi ulnaris. So it is very important whenever adding resistance to the contraction of the client's muscle to never cross a joint that does not need to be crossed. In this case, I resist at his distal forearm here. I do not resist by holding on to his hand here. When asking the client to contract the target muscle, it is important to choose the best action of the target muscle. The pronator teres can flex the forearm at the elbow joint and it will engage and we can palpate it. However, if we ask the client to pronate the forearm at the radio ulnar joints, the pronator teres muscle contracts better and it pops out and is easier to palpate. Now the problem is that when I get to here, the pronator teres runs deep to the brachioradialis. If I ask him to pronate from a fully supinated position, the brachioradialis will contract also, blocking the ability to palpate the deeper pronator teres. If instead I bring him to a position that's halfway between full supination and full pronation, and instead I start from here, now when he contracts against my resistance, the brachioradialis will not contract and only the pronator teres will, and as I continue to palpate it distally, I can palpate the pronator teres through the brachioradialis.